So simple tutorial. Good morning, students. Welcome to SST. So simple tutorial. In the previous class, we had discussed about the sea roots and their importance. We saw how food served as a means of cultural link between distant regions. We also saw how global transfer of disease in pre-modern world helped in the colonization of America. Today we will take up unit two, that is the 19th century. This 19th century is very important. Three types of movements or flows took place within international economic exchange. First, flow of trade. Second, flow of labor. And third, the movement of capital. Flow of trade refers to the trade in goods. Goods were exported from one country and imported by another. Just as India exported tea and spices and imported manufactured goods. Flow of labor refers to the migration of labor from one country to another, mainly in search of employment. Flow of capital means movement of capital from one country to another for short term or long term investments. All of these flows represented that a world economy was gradually emerging. In a world economy, different economies get integrated and come to depend upon each other for various needs. This process only got acceleration at the end of the 20th century and early 21st century and came to be known as globalization. Okay. In the late 18th century, industrialization and population growth had increased the demand for food grains in Britain. This situation resulted in the increase in food grain prices. But there was something called Corn Laws which was in operation in Britain. What is this law? Let us understand it first. The Corn Laws were not one law but a series of laws enacted between 1815 and 1846. The word corn used here includes all cereal grains that is wheat, oats and barley. The year 1815 indicates that they came into being after Napoleonic Wars. This law restricted the import of corn, so this law kept corn prices at high level. Basically, this law was intended to promote and protect big landlords and farmers from cheap foreign imports of grain. This blockade of grains led to increased profits for their homeland farmers and the farmers wished to retain this higher rate of profit. Now due to this law, the British people had no choice but to buy grains only from within the country. The working class was thus unable to afford anything other than their food. This forced them to stop buying manufactured goods which affected the profits of the industrialists. So, whereas the farmers and landowners benefited, the working class in the cities and the industries became unhappy. So, there was a lot of opposition to this law from the industrialists and urban dwellers. Then came the Irish potato famine of 1845. Recall, we read this in the previous class. So, this law was finally repealed in 1946. After the law was repealed, British began to import food grains from the rest of the world. These products were relatively cheaper than British produced goods and food grains. Thus, the supply of corn from outside helped to bring down the prices and consumption in Britain increased. What happened thereafter in Britain? British agriculture could not compete with the prices of imported goods. Agriculture no more remained a profitable business. So the rural folks left their lands uncultivated and rushed to the cities to find jobs in industries. Some of them even migrated overseas. Now from the mid 19th century when industrial growth picked up speed, this resulted in higher incomes and therefore more food imports. Now what is happening outside Britain? 
In Eastern Europe, Russia, America and Australia, lands were being cleared to expand food production basically to meet the demands of people. But production alone could not fulfill the objectives. Other infrastructural facilities were also needed. How was food to be transported? That means to connect the agricultural regions and seaports, new railway lines were required to be laid. Thus began the process of establishing railways and making ports. Besides, people had to settle on the lands to bring them under cultivation which meant building of homes and settlements. All of these activities required labor and capital. So the demand for labor in America and Australia was met by migration of people. About 50 million people emigrated from Europe to America and Australia in the 19th century. And all over the world, some 150 million are estimated to have left their homes who crossed oceans in search of better future. You can see few pictures of migrating people on the slide. 1. Figure 6. Emigrant ship leaving for the US. 2. Irish emigrants waiting to board the ship. This is the picture made in 1874. As far as capital is concerned, it flowed from financial centers like London. So, by the 1890s, a global kind of agricultural economy had begun to take shape. An economy which was accompanied with the movement of labor. An economy which was accompanied with the flow of capital. The food no longer came from a nearby village but from thousand miles away. This food was not grown by a peasant in his own land. It was grown by an agricultural worker in a large farm, which very recently had been a forest. Just see the change. The food was transported by railways and ships built for that very purpose. So dear students, what actually the abolition of corn laws in Britain did? It set in motion a new process by which different nations of the world started to get integrated with the rest of the world. Can we see it like this? Okay. When the rest of the world was experiencing such changes, a similar type of change occurred in India, though on a small scale. In West Punjab, which is in Pakistan today, the British government laid a network of irrigational canals to transform the semi-arid regions into fertile lands that could grow wheat and cotton for export. These areas irrigated by these canals were called canal colonies. Those who settled there were peasants from other parts of Punjab. Students, let me stop here now. Time for probable questions now. 1. What are the three flows which were helpful in the globalization of the 19th century? Two. What are corn laws? Why were they abolished in Britain? 3. How was the food problem solved in Britain after the scrapping of the corn laws? Explain. 4. Explain the impact of scrapping of the corn laws. 5. What were canal colonies? Why were they built? Students, now it is your time to read your books to read and prepare answer to these questions. In the next class, when we meet, we will discuss next to me, role of technology. Till then, keep reading and have a nice day. Thank you.